Hi, it's Dennis Daly. There's a place just about two hours south of Washington, D.C., where time stands still. It's Colonial Williamsburg, a step back into Revolutionary War times and slightly after. But according to what I found out when I got down there, it was almost in ruins before someone forked up the money to restore this sacred part of America's history. Williamsburg was restored through a grant from John D. Rockefeller back in the 1930s. You go there and you feel as if it is indeed colonial times. During the daytime, there are no cars. You don't see any telephone poles or electric lights for the most part. You may see a fire hydrant kind of hidden away for safety reasons, but all you have to do is let your imagination wander and you're back in the 1700s. We are the guests of Williamsburg this week, and of Brian O'Day, he is the general manager of the Williamsburg Inn, which is a fabulous, wonderful place to stay. It really captures the flavor of the 1700s. I went there not only to explore Williamsburg for the first time, but to also talk about, of all things, the magnificent food service that is available there. So on a very crisp weekend, Brian O'Day, the general manager of the Williamsburg Inn, and I began to walk around and talk about about the history of one of America's most historic small towns. It's the original colonial capital of, uh, of Virginia, served as the uh, seat of government back in the uh, 1700s. Uh, uh, the founding fathers uh, met here, George Washington, Patrick Henry, uh, George Wythe, Thomas Jefferson went to school here, and the uh, original buildings that they met in and uh, convened, uh, convened their governments in uh, are here and preserved by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. And a lot of the original structures are exist today and are maintained by the foundation. And a lot of the other structures were reconstructed uh, on the original uh, foundations to the original specifications and are uh, totally restored and recreated. How far are we from the Jamestown area here? We're about uh, eight miles from Jamestown and about 12 miles from Yorktown. And it's an area we call uh, now the Historic Triangle, uh, Williamsburg, Jamestown, and Yorktown making that up. You look at uh, Jamestown, the first permanent settlement, of course, Yorktown, that's where the, uh, the Revolutionary War ended. So in a way, it's kind of started and stopped here in, in a hypothetical situation. What, what about the restoration? You, you alluded to that first. When, when did they decide that, hey, all of this is here, but it really is not going to be here forever unless we do something? A, a concept of, of Reverend uh, W.A.R. Goodwin uh, of the Bruton Parish Church uh, that we'll be walking by here in a, in a moment. And he, uh, he had this idea, this vision of restoring the colonial capital and uh, shopped, shopped the idea out to some of the major philanthropists of, uh, of the day, uh, was, uh, was turned down by a couple and uh, found Mr. John D. Rockefeller, who uh, was uh, very supportive of, of the cause, the concept, the idea, uh, came down here, liked it, and then uh, commenced the restoration back in the uh, early 1930s. What had happened to all of this? Was it really in a state of disrepair? Was it private homes? Uh, what, what did this look like before the restoration began? It looked like a, uh, a regular, small, sleepy, uh, southern time, that, that, that town that time forgot. Uh, it was a normal, we'll be walking down Duke of Gloucester Street. Uh, there were filling stations and residential homes and regular drug stores and uh, uh, just a regular commercial small town. So the idea then was, well, obviously to return this to the way it looked. The only modern thing I can see here is a, a fire hydrant for kind of innocuous looking fire hydrant. Other than that, you could probably film a movie here, and I'm sure some have been, that, that would have looked as it did, um, you know, 300 years ago. Uh, that, that's correct. It's, it's been put back and very historically accurate, and the historic integrity of the area is maintained. Uh, you'll, you won't see a lot of uh, electric lights uh, outside. Uh, uh, the, uh, the windows are all shuttered. Uh, the, the tenants of the various houses here uh, are not, uh, don't, don't display... Uh, 20th century window treatments, uh, and all uh, all the buildings are owned uh, and operated by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. And no neon signs. No neon signs, <laughs> no. We're open and operational uh, fully 365 days, or this year 366 days a, a year, and even uh, the, the most bitter uh, 
weather we had this year, we still remained open and operational. Uh, I happen to think the winter time or, uh, is one of the best times to visit. Uh, the crowds are not here, everything is open and you have full access to it. We run a lot of uh, special programs during the winter, uh, gourmet, uh, gourmet culinary weekends at the Williamsburg Inn and Lodge where we bring in uh, visiting chefs and, uh, and vintners, educational programs such as the Antiques Forum uh, run by Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and various learning weekends and colonial weekends. Uh, that we host in the foundation, uh, ranging from everything from uh, uh, conserving uh, conserving antiques to Civil War uh, to uh, uh, putting together the whole foundation. And it's something that is very much at the forefront of our future as we assemble the uh, Williamsburg Institute, which is going to uh, allow uh, visitors total access to uh, our our various operations and what we do on a uh, limited or a broad brush basis. And our first kickoff of the Williamsburg Institute will be this fall in November with a uh, cookbook celebration. Now, Brian, we're walking beside a, a gentleman here who, who looks as if he's been here from the 1700s. Uh, that's uh, that's right. I'm not sure if that's uh, George Wythe or uh, or another colonial governor, but uh, we we have many uh, colonial uh, character interpreters who uh, stay in uh, not only colonial costume but colonial character. And uh, as we approach them and speak to them, uh, they will not leave. Uh, the 18th century. How do you uh, take some of the buildings out of service in order to spruce them up? I guess the off-season is the ideal time to do that. Well, we, we certainly know uh, our visitation levels, and we also know the, uh, of the, the foundation in general, and then also the most popular buildings. That lets us know what buildings should go out of inventory for how long of a time and what the exact needs are. Uh, oftentimes, a building will go out simply to be uh, cleaned up and spruced up after the season. Other times we find uh, uh, major research discoveries, I guess would be the way to put it, that uh, allow us to reinterpret the building and change some of the internal uh, uh, interpretation. Well, now, you uh, do a lot of different weekends here. One of them, which I think would, if anything, would fit in with the decor here nicely, would be a weekend you do on antiques. That's, that's right. That's uh, not only a weekend, it's a, a, a full week-long program. Uh, it's, it's at the uh, first week of February every, every year, and uh, we bring in some of the foremost authorities on uh, American antiques and uh, conservators, curators from uh, around the country. One of the things I know that uh, is part and parcel of why we're here this weekend is to sample the food. I know one of the flaws I find, uh, and not to be critical of them, but you go to a place like, like Epcot, you may sample a lot of different scientific and historical things, but you're still going to have a hamburger when it comes time to eat. Is that part and parcel of the whole aura of this? I mean, the food service, how, how important is that to you and how much work goes into making it authentic? Uh, an awful lot of work goes into making it authentic and we view uh, the food and the food program, especially in our colonial taverns, of which we have four operating colonial taverns, uh, another opportunity to interpret history and uh, allow our visitors and guests an insight into what they might have experienced uh, two, three hundred years ago on the streets of Williamsburg. You know, one of the things that impresses me as we walk around, and I guess everybody has a preconceived notion of where they're going before they get there, is that Williamsburg is larger than I thought. I guess when you think of the 1700s, you think the fact that we had such a small population, but that doesn't mean we had small towns. Uh, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, Williamsburg was a very bustling uh, commercial, uh, commercial town. It was located uh, very favorably in the, the Tidewater area, so good water access up the James River and York River. And uh, was being the seat of government was quite a bustling spot for uh, for commerce. Also, uh, the major planters up and down the James River, both sides, uh, certainly bolstered a strong, uh, strong and vibrant economy. Uh, it is a lot bigger than people think. Uh, it, it, the breadth and depth of what we offer. Uh, interesting, Duke of Gloucester Street though is only one mile end to end, but uh, you go from uh, the current 20th century. Uh, all the way down to uh, 300 years ago. What's the most common comment you get from people, I would think, particularly from 
young kids growing up now, I mean, I have a hard time convincing some of my younger friends that I was four years old before we got our first television. They don't, <laughs> they don't seem to understand that. But uh, what kind of comments do you get from, from young kids who are used only to popping something in the microwave and the era of electricity and computers when they really realize that, uh, you know, even though this was a modern bustling city for its time, some of the things compared, well, in food preparation even with what we do now seem kind of primitive. It's amazing how quickly they pick up on, on the difficulties back then uh, of, of doing things and the simplistic approach and why uh, it was simplistic. Uh, was out of necessity and, and not having the advanced techniques, but uh, they're very interested in it and quickly uh, want to know why and, and search down for uh, what they can bring back to, to their their current way of thinking. They, the, uh, the microwave generation looking at, uh, gee, that's how they did something quick back then. Is it difficult today to find people who know about that kind of cuisine? There must be a lot of research you have to do to keep it authentic. Well, we're very fortunate to have basically the experts in the field working for the foundation and a, a, a heritage and a, a program we've preserved through the food waste program. Also in the uh, working taverns uh, that, that we operate, uh, it, we're constantly evolving and uh, working with the product there. A very bright, educated young man who seems to love what he does, Andrew McKnight, is one of those people dressed in colonial costumes. He is also a fine chef, and we talked to him at the governor's palace where he had made for us many of the foods that would have been made in colonial Williamsburg back in the 1700s. I asked him how he got interested in all of that. Well, I, my primary interest lies in historical work, uh, historical work in general and educational work. Um, as far as this, I just fell into it. I applied for the job, I got it, and uh, went from there. As far as learning the technologies and the arts of 18th century cooking, um, it's not going to be too much different from somebody having to learn how to cook in a modern restaurant kitchen today. To be able to cook efficiently and well, um, you have to know your heat levels. Mm -hmm. And learning your heat levels in here certainly is a little bit different than learning your heat levels in a commercial application today. but. Uh, it's um, the same kind of principles. So. The heat source is wood? The heat source in this kitchen actually is charcoal. Charcoal. Uh, according to the account book left to us by Governor Botetuck's second principal cook, uh, he's purchasing um, literally close to tons of charcoal uh, when needed from uh, local suppliers. And the reason really is that being an English cook, he had not been trained to cook with wood. He'd been trained to cook with alternate fuel sources. Most colonial kitchens, 99% uh, of colonial kitchens are going to be wood burning though because it's the least expensive fuel source. Is it more difficult to cook with charcoal? You mentioned heat level. Is it hotter than wood? Well, we work in two different kitchens here at Colonial Williamsburg. We work at uh, here at the Governor's Palace kitchen. We also work at the With kitchen. I prefer cooking with charcoal for the simple reason the tools we use um, allow me to cook in an upright position. Charcoal also will always burn at a constant temperature. Uh, carbon is carbon. Whereas uh, the embers that are generated from hardwoods are going to be different. Can, well, the different hardwoods, how old the hardwoods were when they were cut, uh, how well the hardwoods were seasoned, so there are a lot more variables. Uh, if you know what you're doing, you can get similar results, but I would say it's probably easier to cook. I envy your, your pots and pans here, which is probably not the right thing. I remember interviewing Chuck Williams, who was the founding father of the Williams-Sonoma chain. Mm -hmm. I mentioned pots and pans to him, and he, he stopped me and said, they're not just pots and pans, you know. There's something fancier than that. You, you have a great supply of uh, copper. Are the trays pewter, or mm -hmm. they are? Mm -hmm. it, do you like cooking in copper? Yeah, it's fantastic, really. What's your favorite thing to cook? Oh, gosh. Um, or things. I, by, I, I, by the look on your face, it's not just one. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on the mood, I guess. But um, I, I like to do pastry design and pastry work, and I also like to do sauce work. Uh, and that's something that we get to explore a, a lot of here at the Governor's Palace Kitchen because of the uh, European influences and the European training of the cooks. I wanted to ask about a peculiar kind of stove there. It's called a stew stove. It has three openings where burners would be with a grating on top, the whole thing covered in masonry and paint painted with whitewash, it was the darndest thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, this is a, a very European piece of cooking equipment referred to as a stew stove. 
And uh, what it is is a series, and you would see them as large as, I believe, um, well, larger than 10 burners in some particular applications in, in England. Um, this particular one is a three-burner stew stove. They're something they called a fire basket in which you put live charcoal, and you stack up uh, charcoal on top of that, and the level of the charcoal will give you your individual heats. Uh, it's referred to in the 18th century as a moderate heat. Uh, a high heat would be good for, uh, considered a quick heat. And also a slack heat, which would be a low heat for just simmering things, etc. Um, the reason that it's almost a necessity to have one of these in this particular kitchen at the governor's palace is the need for exact heats and confection work, and also in sauce work and things mm -hmm. like that as well. So it's it's a, it's it's a very needed and also wanted um, kind of luxury stove, I guess. Or so the the the, the regular. Uh run-of-the-mill person wouldn't, wouldn't have been of a degree of affluence to have something like this. Oh, certainly not. Um, at, as it stands right now, it's the only well-documented example we have for this time period in Williamsburg. Uh, that is not necessarily to say there weren't others. We just don't have enough evidence to uh, really to document them well enough to install them. Now, are you cooking on here, or is it simply a museum item? Uh, we do cook on it, and we ran into a bit of a problem with uh, carbon monoxide buildup. But uh, it, it does not vent properly um, when all the windows and all the doors are shut up. But as far as a tool is concerned, um, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, as far as its efficiency in cooking, it works very, very well. What does it feel like? to cook this way, to realize that you're not only, I would presume, having fun, mm. but yet you're, you're providing a historical lesson, particularly for young people. What, what, is it, what is it like to be here amid all of this in Williamsburg? Oh, it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, I think there's so many aspects to this job that ultimately make it very rewarding. Uh, one, of course, is the educational aspect of, of taking uh, research and reading and synthesizing that into something that you can present to the public, whether it be a school age public or an adult uh, public. But um, the other aspect is the actual historical research involved and always discovering new things. Hey, it will never get boring because you'll never know everything. And that's uh, it's a very good thing. Also, I guess inherent in what you're saying, and it, it just occurred to me, I was talking to Brian about bringing history alive, there's probably no better way to do that than food. I mean, food is such a friendly, therapeutic thing anyway. It, it, it's not just this sterile link to the past you're providing. You can eat it. Mm -hmm. F food is um, also fairly unique in that it was, it's a trade today and a trade in the 18th century that everybody has to deal with. Um, other trades, silversmithing, blacksmithing, shoemaking, uh, seem sort of esoteric in our world because you just don't see them practiced as often. Whereas cooking is something that even you know your average college student will have at least a base knowledge of. And in the 18th century, it was also very much a life skill. Uh, the degree of that skill, of course, is going to vary with the individual and the individual situation. Don't tell me there were some bad cooks in the 1700s. Oh, I'm sure there were. Uh, hopefully not here at the governor's palace, but... Uh, or you wouldn't be here very long. Yeah, I, th I think one thing that is, is, is a little bit more true of the, uh, well, really the 18th century is that um, cooking was considered more of a genteel art. Uh, there was more emphasis placed on dining as, as a social practice, and therefore there may have been more influence, and um, probably was more influence placed on the quality of food presented. Andrew, give us a description of some of the uh, things you fixed here. This is mostly all, uh, well, a couple of exceptions, but mostly pastry. Uh, one thing, actually, that's uh, unfortunately we're not depicting too well here on the table is, is the... Um, abundance of red meats, especially at this time of the year, but you also would see variety at all times of the year in, in, in things like fowl and, and small game, and especially seafood here, considering we're uh, in between two of the largest rivers here in Virginia, and, and not too far from the Chesapeake Bay as well. Uh, some of the things that we have here on the table, of course, some are pastries. We finished up a chocolate pudding today, which has uh, really the grated processed cacao bean as opposed to the milk chocolate of today. It's, it's very, very bitter, and there's really not much you can do to, to change that. Uh, you can add sugar to it, but uh, it's still going to have that bitter aftertaste. Um, we also have a spinach tort here, another pastry, uh, with layers of spinach, egg, cheese, and breadcrumbs over the top. That was baked. And we also have some lemon cheesecakes here, which are a, a mixture of cream, uh, lemon peel, 
uh, sugar and eggs done in a puff pastry crust in this particular case. Uh, the only two actual meat dishes we have on the table are a chine section of pork, which is a backbone section that has been boned, stuffed, and then roasted. And we also have the favorite Virginia ham, salt cured and smoked. Salt curing for preservation, not so much a concern this time of the year, but in the summertime you definitely want to have preserved red meats. Uh, and the smoking process, purely a flavoring, uh, generally using green hardwood fires of hickory, oak, or uh, even fruit woods. You know, one of the things I realize is, and, and this may sound very naive to say this, we are a child of Great Britain, and so so much of their meat is consumed as meat pies historically. Is, is, are a lot of things put in pastry? I know, for example, in my time visiting Amish communities in, in Pennsylvania and southern Indiana, there seems to be a lot of that. Whatever it is, you put it inside pastry. Oh, certainly. Um, well, we do see that even in today's world. Uh, meat pies typically in the 18th century were just meat pies. Uh, you also see the custard mixture, which would be similar, I guess, to, to quiches in our world. Uh, and those are typically the two things that you will see put into a pastry. You do also see fruit pies, of course, uh, whole fruit pies, and you also see vegetable pies as well. Uh, the difference is, and you do see... Um, unique examples of mixing meats with vegetables and mixing fruit with vegetables, but typically a vegetable pie will just be a vegetable pie and a fruit pie will just be a fruit pie. Well, now a crowd of people have just come in. Are you all from the same place? You all, are you one big group or do you know each other? No. You don't. Where, where are you all from? Yell it out. Iowa. Richmond, Denver. Denver? Did you say Iowa? This, this is not atypical, is it? I mean, to have people from all over. This is pretty standard, actually. Do you have many uh, European visitors here? Oh, quite a few, actually. We had a, a couple in from France this morning. Um, a lot of German visitors and a lot of um, a lot of people from Great Britain, especially. I'm going to let you talk to these yeah, people. Sure. Thank you, Andrew. If you guys do have any questions. That's an unusual sound. It's called a hurdy-gurdy. You've probably heard the phrase before. I had never heard one played. A young man named Gene Shostak was there at one of the restored taverns at Colonial Williamsburg, giving us the authentic sound of the 1700s. Williamsburg is a remarkable place, and from the rowdy sounds of the tavern to the genteel sounds of the Williamsburg Inn. I go on an assignment and it turns out to be so spiffy I feel almost out of place or underdressed. A sumptuous five-course meal completed a weekend in which people had come from all over the nation to sample the food and the wine and the ambiance of Colonial Williamsburg and the beautifully restored Williamsburg Inn. The gentleman who was in charge of the food had come down from Washington, D.C. His name, Gerard. The restaurant bears the same name in the nation's capital. Well, we are going to have several courses uh, tonight. And uh, the first course is a, a dish I like very much. And it's called uh, Ten of Winter Vegetable. Gerard had the audience enthralled with his wonderful manner, but also the fantastic food that we were to have in the beautiful ambiance of the Williamsburg Inn. After the meal, I sat down and talked to him about the presentation. It's a work of passion. So uh, when you're passionate about something, it doesn't seem as hard as uh, it is really people who don't understand things it's very difficult but the reward it's uh, i think there is two reward there is a reward of uh, the people who eat your food who talk about it and uh, like it and uh, compliment you about it but there is a reward of uh, i think the most important it's uh, the craft of uh, the artist and i think the toughest judge and uh, and it's probably me <laughs> and uh, I know when I do good I know when I don't do as good and I think it's uh, an eternal uh, uh, beginning you try to uh, to refine what you're doing and uh, I think it's uh, as a reward is uh, uh, to perfect your craft and now usually you're in Washington DC right what is it like to come down to a different location different stove different kitchen and and try to do the same thing here well, first of all you yes it's true it's difficult you uh, you deal with my restaurant is much smaller than the, 
the number of people we serve tonight. But, uh, I had a very nice crew to help me. I didn't do any ev every single dish exactly the way I would like to, to do them. But I think the most important thing is people come for an event and uh, they, sat, they sit at large table. I, uh, I said uh, this morning, I never open a bottle of wine for myself. I open a bottle of wine with, when at least I have one friend, and it means that part of the gastronomic things is to share, to talk about it, to share. And I think even if you have some imperfection, it's not a problem. And I think in art, imperfection is a quality. I think perfection is boring. Perfect, <laughs> perfection is more industrial mm -hmm. because it's very square. And uh, when you're an artist, you're never perfect. And I think, uh, well, maybe maybe a few things could have been better. I think overall, uh, if I have to judge myself, I'm pretty pleased of the food we serve tonight. It was wonderful. Did you always want to be a chef when you were growing up as a child? Did you want to be a doctor or a race driver or something else? I, uh, uh, I wanted to be a surgeon. I wanted to always to work with my uh, hands, but uh, I had too much uh, influences from my parents. My mother used to be a very good cook. My father, his hobby was food and wine. And uh, I, uh, since I am very young, I'm uh, submerged by uh, good food and good wine. And I am from a generation where we started to, to have uh, star chefs. And uh, it was a very, uh, uh, I would say, fashionable uh, profession when I, uh, I started to be a chef. I think it still is. And uh, I have no regret because after 28 years of cooking, I, uh, I think I, uh, I have the same passion in the first day. What would you say to people about the fact that, unfortunately for so many young people, we're becoming a, a society of microwave and sandwiches, that there's just something so wonderful, so therapeutic about sitting down to a complicated, different flavor meal such as we had this evening. I mean, I, th I, I really feel for people who are losing all of this. I think uh, we are not losing only that. I think people watch TV instead of reading. When you read, you have to think. When you watch TV, you don't have to think. Uh, people don't take the time to talk anymore. And uh, Maybe we, at one point, we will go so far in, the, uh, I would say, in uncivilized uh, societies that maybe they will come back to a more civilized uh, society and they will take time to eat, they will take time to... One of the reasons you we eat, and uh, I think it's very enjoyable in France, is because it's the time you talk with your family. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pretty important. Yes. And... Uh, and I think if uh, I think I disagree a little bit because we have fortunately a lot. First of all, if nobody would care about food, I will be out of business, and I really. Believe, and you're certainly not out of business. And no. not out of business, and I think there is more than ever good restaurant in Washington, for instance. And in the last few years, we saw that uh, a lot of uh, food stores, uh, good food stores, are open, like. Uh, Freshfield, Bread and Circus recently, Dean and De Luca, and certain place gourmet. So it means that people are more interested, are willing to buy better food, and uh, so I'm optimistic about it. Girard from Girard's in Washington, D.C., has come down and has prepared a beautiful five-course meal. We've been talking to him about his love of cooking, and I wanted to ask him what his own favorite dish or concoction was. I think food is very emotional, and... Uh, I don't feel eating the same thing every day. I can tell you that tomorrow I want to eat this and three days later I want to eat this. I think if I feel that the person who cooks is uh, very emotional about what they're doing, it could be, uh, it could be a woman cooking for you, it could be a, a friend chef cooking for you. And I think it's, uh, I have to admit also myself, if someone comes to my restaurant and say, chef, fix a menu, choose a wine, you put everything you have to please them. You have a, it's a 
it's a question of being two. It's like when you're making love. You, if you're not two, it doesn't work. And I think cooking is a, li- is a little bit the same. You, you, you need to have someone uh, on the other side of the, of the line. And uh, I, uh, I had some great meal, great dinner, not great meal, great dinner, which was simple. And I had maybe some great meal where I didn't appreciate the same way because maybe I was not with the right people, maybe I was not in the right mood. And I remember one day Paul Bocuse telling me, he said, you know, let's take two couples. One couple just won the lottery. (laughs) And you are in a bad mood. You cook the worst dinner you ever made in your restaurant. They're going to think it's the best meal they ever had. And he said, At the same time, you cook the best you can. And uh, people had a a fight at home, they had a flat tire in their way, and they are not going to enjoy the dinner. Mm -hmm. Well, this was certainly wonderful tonight. I can't wait to come see you in Washington. Thank you. Oh, there are so many hidden away treasures in the U.S. Williamsburg certainly is well known. There was a government summit meeting there. There have been wonderful seminars. And ever since John D. Rockefeller put out the money to restore it back in the 1930s, Williamsburg has become a center of history and culture. But a lot of people, such as myself, just never got around to getting there. So I'd like to thank Meredith Whiting and Pam Murphy for taking the time to provide the wherewithal for us to take American Montage to Colonial Williamsburg. The food was wonderful and the hospitality, and I've said it throughout the program, but I'm going to say it again. You go to Williamsburg for the history, and you leave talking about the food. My special thanks also to Brian O'Day, who is the manager of the Williamsburg Inn, to Andrew McKnight and Gene Shostak, two of those people who provide so much of the ambiance and the living history there, and to Chef Gerard, who brought his culinary expertise all the way down from Washington, D.C., to participate in a wonderful wine and food and cheese weekend. Also, there are, of course, a lot of other weekends in Williamsburg, and even though we are coming into better weather, please remember it is a year-round destination with one of the most easy-to-remember 800 numbers I've ever heard, 800-HISTORY. So if you have any questions about Colonial Williamsburg, just give them a call at 1-800-HISTORY. Again, my special thanks to Colonial Williamsburg and to Meredith, Pam, Brian, Andrew, Dean, and of course, Chef Gerard. And one day, we've got to take our microphones to his restaurant in the nation's capital and see if he'll grace us with some more of that wonderful food. You know, were it not for Colonial Williamsburg, a lot of movies about colonial times would have to build really expensive sets. I'm Dennis Daly.